By their very nature and imposing design, banks are mighty financial fortresses that exude an aura of wealth and opulence. The message of architecture and bank history is a very interesting one. A bank building radiating the message of solidity, stability, trustworthiness. A bank's powerful structure offers the implicit promise that your money is safe inside these walls. Throughout history, banks have maybe given a little more attention than most businesses to their uh, appearance. Big skyscrapers showing that there's a substantial resources there are a part of the mystique of, uh, of banking uh, to give people that confidence. The bank is more than a building. A bank is something very special. A bank is trust, faith that people have in the bankers, in what they do. It is that representation of trust that is at the very core of a bank's existence. Without it, a depositor loses faith, and a bank reneges on its fundamental pledge. Within the past decade, modern technology has launched a revolution that has dramatically altered the way banks and their customers do business. A new era of electronic banking has moved to the Internet, and soon it may even be possible to do your banking in the kitchen, using a microwave oven. We realize the Internet is a powerful, new tool that's going to change financial services and the way they're delivered. Today there are less than 10 million consumers doing online banking and that'll be over 100 million in the near future. From millionaires to average depositors, security has always been the most important thing a bank has to offer. Nowhere else is that security more apparent than inside a vault. They want to see a vault door. Little children and old men, they want to see them. Little old ladies, there's my dollar in there. At the historic J.P. Morgan building on Wall Street, this 52-ton vault protected the economic empires of America's business elite during the early part of the 20th century. The vault stood in silent defiance to anyone who would dare even think of crossing its threshold without proper authorization. Morgan's gargantuan vault was the heart of the bank itself, literally the cornerstone of its success. It's the backbone, the spine of it all. That's what people see, that's what they recognize, and that's what they feel comfortable with. They feel that the bigger their vault is, the more successful their bank is. A modern bank vault is a six-sided box constructed of different layers of various materials. The innermost layer is a thick steel lining that makes up the floor, walls, and ceiling. A concrete casing surrounds the steel cage. It's all encased by a web-like system of steel reinforcing rods inserted both in and around the concrete shell for additional strength. The most visible and impressive feature of a bank vault has always been its door. The banker, he wanted to make sure that he was protecting the assets of his clients, and so uh, bigger was better as far as thick walls with a big massive vault door on it. The vault door is a mountain of metal. Its hinges must be able to support a weight of as much as 20 tons, but be able to swing open smoothly and efficiently. Advancements in technology enabled the construction of bank vaults to change considerably over the latter part of the 20th century. In the 20s, bank vaults were 27 to 30 inches of concrete. Now they are making them down to 12 inches of concrete. The concrete is 8 to 12 times stronger than it was in the 1920s. The steel materials that are going into the safes are also 10 to 12 times stronger than they were in the 1920s. Vault doors face a trial by fire at the Underwriters Laboratory in Illinois. Technicians attack vault doors to determine how reliable they really are. The main concern of a, of a banker would be to put a product in there that has been tested by certified trained professionals to emulate what a high skilled burglar would bring in to try to penetrate that structure. The longer it takes to successfully assault a vault, the higher its security rating. The 
The UL rating system for safes starts at a five minute container and progresses through 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and one hour. At the highest end, which would be one hour and explosion resistant, uh, you would find a jewelry safe, which could contain several million dollars worth of jewelry. Vault construction also incorporates a variety of sophisticated alarm systems. A sound accumulator is a device that is actually a microphone that's placed inside the vault and it listens to and four sounds, like somebody pounding on the side of a vault, and it accumulates it and keeps track of it, and after a certain amount of time or a certain level is reached, it then trips the alarm. Bank vaults include special openings for other electrical systems that support interior lights and conduits for telephone lines. It is critical that vaults also have openings to accommodate air intake and exhaust conduits. The earlier ones didn't have it, the newer ones do, but the banks would always put in what we call a vault ventilator system. It's, a, it's in case you were locked into a vault in a hostage situation or just heard it in there after a robbery or whatever, the employees or the people inside that vault would have the ability to turn a fan on that would suck air in from the outside. In addition to guarding the bank's separate cash containers, a typical vault also houses a gleaming array of safe deposit boxes. They are actually a safe within a safe. But surprisingly, they may not be quite as sturdy as you think. It's a casing, which is a five-sided box that was a quarter-inch thick solid steel. And then on there, some brass hinges were, were put on there with a half-inch thick polished steel door boxes have basically gotten lighter because your casings are thinner now. Some are just hollow doors with a lock on them. The banking industry said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm spending X amount of dollars to build this massive concrete vault and putting this expensive vault door on it. Give me something that's cheaper to lock up inside of my room here. A safe deposit box has two keys, one for the customer, one for the bank. The box can't be opened without two keys at the same time. Everything in a bank, for auditing purposes, is under what we call dual custody. Whether it be a vault door, whether it be a night depository receiving chest, a safe deposit box, a cash safe, a teller's locker, it's going to take more than one person to get access to open that door to get whatever the contents are out. Simple combination locks opened early bank vaults and safes. But this kind of lock was attractive to criminals, who could open them with relative ease. It also created the possibility that a bank manager could be kidnapped and forced to open his own vault. Time locks were developed as a way to prevent that. The first time lock in a bank vault was installed in 1874. A time clock is a timing mechanism with appropriate linkage internally that is, uh, has to coordinate with the linkage on the combinations. So even though you have, say, the combination properly, if there's still time on the time clocks when you wind them, the combinations aren't going to work. As many as four time locks were installed on bank vaults as a fail-safe system. If one timer stops working, the others continue to operate. Standard time locks were clocks that could be wound for a period of up to 96 hours, or four full days. Some modern vaults use digital time lock technology that allows for an infinite time setting, if so desired. If you try to run your combinations before those time locks have wound down, you put the correct combination on the, time, uh, on the combination locks, but you're still not able to retack the locking bolts or the locking bar, or that safe or vault door. As imposing as a bank vault is, with its massive steel and sophisticated locks, banks are still a lucrative target for criminals. Basic forms of deposit and lending can be traced back to the temples and royal treasuries of Mesopotamia in the 3rd century BC. The ancient Greeks developed strongholds which were used for the safe storage of valuables. The modern concept of a banking system of deposits, withdrawals and loans began in Italy during the Middle Ages. The word bank itself comes from an Italian word called banco, which means bench. And uh, the first bankers, nearly a thousand years ago would go into the piazzas in uh, Venice and Florence and put down their bench 
pull out their account book, somebody would give them money, they would get a credit. Somebody would borrow money, they would get a debit or took out a loan. During the 17th century, goldsmiths in England provided a more contemporary model for modern banking. Goldsmiths were some of the first bankers because they handled a lot of gold, and people learned that they could deposit their gold safely with them and use uh, their accounts with those bankers. The goldsmiths had large amounts of gold on deposit from wealthy clients, which often sat untouched for many years before it was used or returned. The goldsmiths began to loan some of that gold out to others in exchange for a promissory note and the payment of an interest charge. In time, paper certificates redeemable in gold coin were circulated instead of gold itself. When the British Empire reached across the Atlantic Ocean to colonize North America, British banking houses stood at one end of a long chain of global credit that stretched all the way to the new American frontier. Banking only really came uh, to the United States after the American Revolution. Before that, it was effectively pro prohibited by British regulations. And uh, any banking that would have existed prior to that would have been banking done by merchants, uh, even dry goods merchants, providing various forms of credit to their customers, or perhaps uh, various uh, bills, uh, short-term forms of lending. But nothing we would formally consider as a bank. It was a confusing economic period because so many different kinds of currency were already in circulation. In addition to British shillings and pounds, colonists were also using coins from Spain and France. Individual states also began issuing their own money of various denominations. The first bank formed in the United States was formed uh, by Congress in 1781. It didn't open until 1782. It was a part of the effort to straighten out the chaotic finances of the revolution. That was the very first bank. It was in Philadelphia and called the Bank of North America. One of its main supporters was Alexander Hamilton, who would become the first Secretary of the Treasury. But Hamilton had bitter disagreements with other founding fathers over both the necessity and the legality of a federal bank. Of course, his great antagonist was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson wanted to keep the government small. He wanted us to remain a nation of farmers. In Hamilton's view, banks were a key component of development. Uh, Jefferson's view was that, well, you know, the Constitution didn't mention banks. Maybe we didn't really need them. While the new nation and its banks began to flourish, the debate over the role of banks themselves would rage for decades. By the 1800s, there were almost 700 private banks in the United States. Early banks were not the huge institutions that one pictures today. Many banks had their origins in uh, merchants' uh, business, and therefore the banking business would have been done just on the floor of, uh, say, the dry goods store. And slowly, over time, the merchant might have moved into specializing in banking. Each transaction was painstakingly recorded in longhand. Each deposit, each withdrawal, every loan recorded down to the cent. In 1848, a discovery at Sutter's Mill near Sacramento, California, changed the economics of the developing nation practically overnight. The history of banking in the Western United States is the history of the discovery of gold. Uh, gold in the 19th century is the basis of the U.S. monetary system. All U.S. dollars are U.S. gold dollars in the form of gold coins. When gold is discovered, it creates the greatest migration of people in the U.S. history. From one place to another. More than 200,000 people from all over the world headed to California in the three years following the discovery of gold. The owners of a thriving Eastern Express Service company were uniquely poised to handle the increased demands on finance and transportation systems that were spurred by the rapid movement of Americans headed west. Henry Wells and William Fargo developed one of the first great business concepts in American history. The concept that Wells and Fargo developed was combining the transportation and the movement in the security of money with then banking in the form of the extension of credit. Miners needed a place to exchange their gold nuggets for currency. 
Banks needed a way to deal with the sudden influx of the precious metal. A miner in a gold field would bring his raw gold in the form of dust or nuggets into a Wells Fargo office. The raw gold was then typically put on a stagecoach, which then took off to meet either a railroad or a riverboat that would take it to a place like San Francisco or Carson City, Nevada or Denver, Colorado, where it would be transformed into gold coin. Wells Fargo offices of every variety sprang up throughout the West to cash in on the new economy. The gold rush had an enormous impact on the rapid expansion of banks in the United States. By the early 1850s, almost 1,600 banks existed throughout the country. Less than a decade later, another momentous event in American history would change American banks forever. The Civil War not only divided the United States, it came dangerously close to bankrupting the Republic. By 1860, there was still no national currency, and the Civil War made a chaotic condition even worse by creating an avalanche of competing currencies. Confederate states printed their own bills. Banks in Union states did the same. Before the Civil War, all the banks of the country issued their own banknotes. Each one issued several denominations of banknotes, a one, a five, a 10, a 20, maybe a 50. Uh, so take, say, five different denominations of notes and 1,600 banks, you had 8,000 different appearing pieces of paper all representing United States dollars. At the end of the Civil War, the federal government mandated a single currency for the reunited nation. It enforced that order by imposing a 10% tax on earlier currency essentially making it worth that much less. In 1866, at the end of the Civil War, the federal government passed a law saying state banks could no longer issue these notes, and so we got federally backed currency. Out west, the gold rush had ended, and a silver boom had begun in Nevada. But the entire banking structure of the western United States was about to be tested by one of the most devastating natural disasters of all time. At the beginning of the 20th century, the city of San Francisco had begun to come of age. The gold rush era had given it a substantial population. By this time, Wells Fargo Bank had become deeply entrenched in the economic infrastructure. Then, everything literally changed overnight. In April 1906, a great earthquake leveled San Francisco. But the earthquake was not the worst of it. The firestorm that followed the earthquake uh, destroyed uh, all of the remaining infrastructure of virtually the entire city. The banks in particular were in a difficult position because their vaults were so hot as a result of the ensuing firestorm that it was days before they could enter the vaults and see whether or not, in fact, they were still in business. The president of the bank sent a famous telegram to all depositors and correspondents. Building destroyed, vaults intact, credit unaffected. Eventually he discovered that the contents of the vault had indeed survived intact. The calamity was also a trial by fire for another San Francisco financial institution, the Bank of Italy. The actions of its founder, A.P. Giannini, following the earthquake are still the stuff of legend. After the earthquake struck, AP made his way back up to the city and found uh, the city in ruins. And the fire was uh, starting to spread down in the financial district. Well, he and some bank officers decided to take what they could, the gold and the, uh, the cash and the books out of the bank. They put it in a wagon and covered it over with some orange crates to disguise it from looters and took it down through the crowd streaming out of the city. And when he decided to take that money out of that bank, put it into that wagon and get it out of town, he did it quickly. Many bankers wanted to stay closed for up to six months. They weren't sure the city was going to survive. AP said, that's wrong. He said, people need help now. If you don't start lending money, there will not be a San Francisco. He said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to put a desk out on Washington Street Wharf, and I advise all you bankers to beg, borrow, or steal a desk and follow my example. And he began making loans to rebuild the city. 
Giannini had originally opened the Bank of Italy in 1904. By 1918, he had expanded to 24 branches in 18 California cities. Ten years later, there were 292 branches throughout the state. The creation of a vast network of bank branches will be Giannini's legacy. He saw the potential of a thing called branch banking in America when no one had ever applied that concept before. There were banks that had small branches and they were separate offices, but what AP's vision was, was to create a statewide network of branches. Bankers in other cities did not exactly welcome Giannini into their territory with open arms. They saw the spread of his banking empire as a real threat. Uh, other bankers in Los Angeles didn't want him there. The uh, LA bankers took out ads that said, California does not need another Mussolini. That did not stop Giannini. His associates said the snub served to inspire him. He bought a little bank in Los Angeles that had been founded in 1923 called the Bank of America of Los Angeles. He held on to that name until 1930 when he changed the name of all of his banks and banking systems that he had put together by that time into Bank of America. Giannini's vision eventually grew into the largest banking firm in the United States. Giannini's revolution in banking occurred at the same time as an American social revolution that was marked by the women's suffrage movement. But years before women were finally given the right to vote, they were actively solicited by banks as important customers, and they were enticed by promises of special treatment. Banks recognized women were responsible for managing household accounts and they set up special areas in the bank for women customers. The Bank of New York was one of the first financial institutions to offer women a different banking experience from that of its male customers. The women's room in the bank was usually sectioned off. It was private. It was a little bit nicer. Lots of times there were a sofa perhaps or some chairs, a little sitting area, nicer plants, um, really more decorative, almost to feel like a parlor or a living room um, to make the women feel at ease with their financial transactions. It was really a marketing angle to attract women customers and make women feel more welcome in the bank and make their business a part of the bank's business. The bank's challenge with women was the same as it was with men convincing them that their money was safe. One female customer who wasn't totally convinced was Hetty Green. She had inherited a fortune of millions of dollars and made millions more on her own by investing in the stock market. On Friday afternoon, she'd go into the bank. They would lead Hetty down into the vault. She would withdraw all of her money, count it, fill out a deposit ticket, and deposit all of her money back in the bank. I don't think she trusted the bank. It was a common theme of the era, brought on by hundreds of bank failures between 1870 and the early 1900s. The Federal Reserve System was established in 1913 to help change that trend. People lost confidence in their banks. Banks depended upon reserves of gold and silver. They didn't have a central bank backing up the transactions. And when people lost confidence or got scared, they'd run to the bank and they would take out their money and they'd cause a mini crisis in that region. That was, it was a terrible situation. The Great Depression of the 1930s would pose the most monumental challenge to American banks and the country as a whole. Thousands of investors were wiped out in the stock market crash of 1929. But many banks had also made speculative investments on Wall Street. When the bottom dropped out of the stock market, it sent a shockwave of failure and despair through the American banking industry. The fact that you had 25,000 banks all over the United States meant you had 25,000 small institutions. And in banking, what's very important is to be diversified. Be diversified in your depositors, diversified in your loans. These banks tend to be very specialized. And because they were small and undiversified, they were very susceptible to economic shocks. The Great Depression, of course, was a huge shock. There were massive bank failures across the United States. You went from having perhaps around 25,000 banks in the late 1920s to about 14,000 banks around 1933. The failure of so many banks, combined with a nationwide loss of consumer confidence, 
prompted people to stop spending what money they had. That loss of demand led to a dramatic drop-off in the country's production of consumer goods, making things even worse. The result was drastically escalating unemployment. By 1932, 15 million Americans, or 30% of the country's workforce, were out of work. Bank failures fed off that vicious cycle. I would say, in some sense, the Great Depression actually hit rural areas of America before the 1930s. Low crop prices, farmers couldn't repay their bank loans. But these were little tiny banks in places like North Dakota, and they didn't seem to have much impact on the rest of the country. What happened in the 30s is that as prices fell, lots of businesses could not repay their bank loans. Therefore, the banks closed their doors. Therefore, the public lost their money. and idea grew that you ought to just get cash and keep it under your pillow or in your mattress. I can assure you that it is safer for you to keep your money in a reopened bank than to keep it under the mattress. President Roosevelt's response to the bank failures was the New Deal legislation that included banking reforms that would change the industry for more than half a century. Among its provisions, a new concept called deposit insurance. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation guarantees each account up to $100,000. That's an important element of confidence. It doesn't mean much to a business that might leave millions of dollars or transfer millions of dollars through a system, but that insurance gives the individuals confidence that their money is safe and sound. The government also took drastic action that split the banking industry into separate parts. It was decided that uh, because of the stock market crash and the depression, that it would be a good idea to break off commercial banking from investment banking. Commercial banking deals with loans and deposits, investment banking deals with underwriting securities, issuing new securities. The Glass-Steagall Act in 1933 decided that bankers would have to choose either to be commercial bankers or investment bankers, but they couldn't be both. It was thought that banks would be less likely to fail if they were not operating as financial supermarkets. Economists today believe that bigger financial institutions are much safer because their risks are diversified. The merger between Citibank and Travelers Insurance that created the financial behemoth of Citigroup would have been illegal had the Glass-Steagall Act not been repealed in 1999. Coming up next, the evolution of bank security systems. As long as there have been banks, there have been criminals who have been attracted to their cash assets like insects attracted to light. That was never more true than in the Wild West of the late 1800s, when marauding bands of outlaws terrorized banks in small towns on the American frontier. Perhaps the most famous outlaw of the era was Jesse James. His most notorious holdup took place in 1876, when he and his gang tried to rob a bank in Minnesota. When the bank clerk refused to open the safe, James and his accomplices murdered him in cold blood. In the shootout that followed, all of the outlaws except Jesse James and his older brother Frank were either killed or captured. Fifty years later, the Great Depression triggered another nationwide spree of bank robberies and elevated a new generation of criminals to legendary status. The FBI named one of them, John Dillinger, public enemy number one for his daring bank robberies. Dillinger's gang included men with nicknames that belied their violent natures. Babyface Nelson and Pretty Boy Floyd, both of whom were later killed in gun battles with police. It is at the very core of a bank's promise to its customers that the bank will keep deposits safe and sound from both economic peril and human greed. In the old days, the, the thought was to separate the teller from the bad guys, if you will, and you, you had that caged environment. Cages were meant to protect the teller from the threat of harm while providing a possible deterrent against bank robbery. For the most part, they worked. Tellers and their cash drawers were kept at a safe distance from the threat of intrusion from a bank robber. Primitive bank alarm systems were developed in the late 1800s. They started with what they called a multi-box alarm in buildings that they were monitoring, and by just pushing a button in those locations, it would send a certain kind of 
telegraph message to the office. Later, there was a trip wire. And if somebody would walk into the building after hours and trip the wire, it actually sent one of those signals to the central station. So hence the, the term tripping an alarm, which is still what's used today. A modern bank typically is protected by a myriad of alarm systems that can be activated both manually and automatically. A bill trap is actually a device that is placed in the teller drawer and uh, without getting too specific and giving away any of the, uh, the industry secrets, it's a, it's a device that is part of the robbery alarm system. By a teller just simply taking the money out of the drawer, there's a way that it is activated and in fact it sends an alarm signal. Bullet resistant glass was developed that would help shield bank tellers from gunmen who would open fire during a holdup. Technology allowed the glass to get thinner, but stronger. Bullet resistant glass is mainly used at a bank's drive up window. However, sophisticated alarm systems remain at the core of a bank's security. Burglar alarm system for attacks that would take place in an intrusion of type alarm after hours when nobody's in the bank. And then, of course, there's a robbery system that, that would be used to notify law enforcement in the event that a bank robbery takes place. We began to see the use of 35 millimeter or hard print cameras. They were normally put over the doors to catch the full face of someone as they were leaving the office. We're seeing the use of closed circuit television as, as a much greater, uh, quick way to get photographs of someone who's been in the bank. Today, within minutes, you can have photographs of people out of those closed circuit television systems. We're seeing digital recording, which allows a very quick instant use and email of photographs to a police car. To detect bank burglaries after hours, bank lobbies are crisscrossed by a network of sensors. Infrared is a, is a form of motion detection. The infrared measures body heat or measures the heat, ambient heat temperature. Once an area is empty or vacant, a certain ambient temperature gets established. If a human being who has a certain body temperature walks into that, it causes a spike in that temperature and sets an alarm off. There's also ultrasound. Sound waves are actually transmitted, and it's the breaking of those waves, an intrusion into the pattern of waves that takes place that again causes an event to be reacted to. When ultrasound and infrared devices are used in tandem, both must trip independently in order to send an alarm. The system is going to be controlled through a control box where all of the various devices that can trip the alarm feed into so you have a centralized point in the office that is kind of the brains of the alarm system. The simplest system involves a dialer and sends the alarm out over a telephone line which can easily be disabled. But more sophisticated alarms are now being integrated into the bank's data network. To defeat them you have to hack into encrypted data being transmitted continually with constant electronic monitoring at both the send and receive points. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it will be very difficult today. Um, and that's called grade AA line security. Um, to have that kind of encryption on both ends, a handshake that takes place, and a constant monitoring of that alarm so that if the line itself goes away, let somebody cuts the line, that in itself would trigger an alarm and let you know that something is, is amiss. I'm not aware of a perfect security system. Uh, it is almost a chess game sometimes that we play with the bad guys, uh, trying to stay one step ahead of, of the technology. And as we develop it, they find ways to attack it, they find ways to get around it. People are going to try and get to it, and it's just not infallible. Coming up next, the personal banking device that has become a worldwide phenomenon. Plus, internet banking and the question of security in cyberspace. It's estimated that 68 billion checks flow through the banks in the United States every year. The Bank of America's Regional Processing Center in San Francisco handles more than 4 million checks itself every day. Fundamentally have not changed check processing in 30 to 40 years. Checks are without question still one of the preferred methods of moving money that customers and businesses still employ. Up until 1950, checks were merely pieces of paper that banks processed by hand. That changed with the development of a revolutionary new encoding system. Strategically designed numbers were added along the bottom of checks that served to identify them to electronic readers. 
we refer to that as MICA, it stands for Magnetic Ink Character Recognition. It basically tells you everything about that check. It, it'll tell you what bank that check is drawn on. It'll tell you what Federal Reserve District that bank is in. It'll tell you the individual account number and what account it belongs to within that financial institution. In the 1950s, scientists at the Stanford Research Institute helped develop a new machine that would be able to read those ink numbers electronically. They gave their new computer a name, Firma. Electronic recording method of accounting was revolutionary. And by virtue of having getting that accepted across the United States by other banks so that they could exchange checks back and forth technologically, that just changed everything. Irma could process more checks in one day than a bank's accounting department could handle in an entire year. Up until this point, banks had done their bookkeeping by hand. The development of mechanical accounting devices helped speed up the process and made record keeping more practical. But it was still a laborious procedure. The technological ante was raised again by a little piece of plastic that would change everything. The banks quickly realized that the credit card was a natural for them because banks are in the business of helping us make payments and they're in the business of granting credit. The credit card does both. The basic idea of a credit card originated in the United States during the 1920s when a few oil companies and hotel chains began issuing them to customers for purchases made at company outlets. The first national credit card plan was Bank AmeriCard initiated in California by the Bank of America in 1959. It expanded to other states in 1966 and was renamed Visa 10 years later. The convenience of the credit card encouraged the development of another piece of plastic that acted as a key in a revolutionary new device that would change the basic concept of banking, the automated teller machine. What you're talking about is a laminated piece of cardboard uh, with a little bit of magnetic strip on the back. Um, if you had suggested to someone 40 years ago that that would be the primary way most people would deal with their bank, they'd have thought you're nuts. There are more than 850,000 ATMs in use around the world, and every day they dispense an estimated two and a half billion dollars in cash. Automated teller machines were first patented in 1968. The ATM was originally designed to deliver a predefined amount of money in a sealed envelope that came out of the device like a vending machine would deliver a soda. ATMs evolved into dispensers that would release various amounts of cash up to a preset limit and allow customers to conduct other basic banking functions. But what an ATM customer sees is only a small part of the sophisticated device. ATMs are, are both mechanical and electronic. ATMs have dispensers and depositories. The dispenser is roughly two to three times the size of the depository. It's really the heart of the ATM and it takes up the most space. Typically, most ATMs have alarms which will detect uh, an illegal opening of the door. Uh, most of them also can detect vibration and heat. So if someone was uh, uh, trying to blowtorch their way in or trying to knock it off its base, uh, those events would be detected. Um, most of them also uh, have some type of surveillance. The machines also include a device called a runaway switch, which prevents the cash dispenser from sticking in the open position and shooting out $20 bills like a slot machine payoff. Banks like ATM machines because they cut personnel costs by reducing the number of tellers. ATMs also make money by generating withdrawal transactions called surcharges. They have always been accessed by the use of a customer's personal identification number, or PIN, that is physically entered into a keypad. But that is changing. Hello, Eric. My name is Stella. New ATMs will have sophisticated voice recognition capabilities. They'll also be able to speak to the customer. Would you like cash? statement or your usual cash the new generation of ATM will confirm a user's identity through a biometric retinal scan your own unique physical characteristics will soon be your pin 
We've called these things automated teller machines for years, ATMs. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, for the majority of their life, they've only done very few basic transactions. Uh, you can put an envelope in them for deposit or payment. You can withdraw cash, get a balance. The ATM is a device that needed an internet before there was an internet. The internet now allows banks to customize their ATM machines, personalizing screen displays for individual customers. We refer to those as products which are web-enabled. It's not uh, at all inappropriate to think of them as, as street corner web portals. So if there are stocks that you are uniquely interested in, uh, or the weather back home, uh, is there a flight delay today that I need to be worried about? These are the kinds of things that can be customized to the individual user at the ATM. That brings us to the latest form of banking, which is done in cyberspace. Established banks have developed their own websites to complement their brick-and-mortar systems. Meanwhile, startup virtual banks that exist only on the Internet have begun competing for business in this new arena. These online institutions use their cutting-edge status as a selling point. We have some people that are the first to get a cell phone, the first to get pagers when they came out, and they're willing to try any new technology, and Internet banking is a chance for them to be the first on the block with the new technology. Online banking created new concerns about the safety of a customer's money, as well as protecting the customer's identity in cyberspace. Any financial transaction has some degree of risk. The biggest concern for executives at banks is that the data about their customers is kept confidential. There's really two parts of concern. One is privacy and the other is security. Privacy says that no one else on the internet or anywhere else could get information about that customer. And security means that it's the bank's assets are protected, that no hackers would go online to try and get that bank information or that money. For most people, this is a bank. This handheld device is also a bank. The internet is allowing the banks of yesterday to be reduced in size. In essence, whatever device you use to connect to the internet becomes your bank. In some sense, you might say that having your terminal is the ultimate form of uh, a branch for a bank because you have direct access to the bank and you can make your decisions very quickly. But with all these developments in modern technology, is it possible that brick-and-mortar banks are in danger of going out of business? When radio was first introduced, people assumed that there'd be no more need for a newspaper. Everything you could get in a newspaper, you could listen to on the radio. And the reality was, newspaper industry grew even as radio was introduced, and then, of course, television was introduced. So, in the banking world, the introduction of Internet banking is not going to mean that there'll be no more branches in the future. So we believe that branches will continue to serve a purpose and the Internet will augment that branch infrastructure. From its simple beginnings on the piazzas of Italy, banking has come into a new era and a new age. Simple methods of accounting have evolved into the lightning quick transmission of vast sums of money over the Internet. But time and history have not changed the basic tenet of banking, the promise that their customers' money is safe. That financial security is the key issue of what a bank is all about.